Um, so Vanessa and Carlo obviously need, need no introduction, but I think Fred Harrison now needs uh, no introduction since you saw him there on the film. He, he's the research director of the Land Research Trust um, and um, originally was, uh, was here at Oxford at UCL, um, author of uh, a, a, a key book called The Power of the Land. Um, and uh, is, uh, has these very interesting ideas on, on land reform that uh, we're going to hear about in, in, in the film. We're also joined at the end there by, by Robert Holton, um, who is, um, was the campaign's director for eradicating ecocide, the movement that you, you heard a little about in, in the film. And now Robert is the environment, environment and Sustainability Coordinator for the charity Student Hubs. So we, we have some, some contemporary um, ecological voices together with Vanessa's and my Shakespearean voices. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll sort of try and uh, field some questions uh, about how, how we pull those things together. Um, I, I just have one initial thought. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody wants to respond to this, but it was, it was rather wonderful seeing the wolf and the lynx uh, in the film there. Because, of course, one of the things that Shakespeare explores in King Lear is, um, is where King Lear goes out from the apparently civilised world of the court, which is really, of course, a barbaric world, to the apparent wilderness, the wild space, the heath, where indeed there are, many, there are references to the wild cat, to the wolf, and to the, 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 sort of, and the bear, the, the, the cruelty in a way of the animal world, but in a way what, what, what Lear shows is that actually it's the world of power and land ownership that is the true, cruel place, and that in the, in the wilderness, uh, amidst the, uh, the, 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 the wild animals, there is actually um, a kind of harmony and a kind of truth. So um, that was, uh, uh, for me, a wonderful little moment of conjunction between, between film and talk. But I don't know if Carla, you want to pick up on that at all. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm, really glad, uh, I'm really glad you said that, because, uh, well, as a... As, uh, Peter Smith, the CEO of the Wildlife Trust, says, you know, there is this extraordinary harmony that's created. Of course, the lynx is a great example, the bee is a great example. Of course, there are many other ones. And, uh, you know, we can learn so much, as Fred asked and Peter replies, we can learn so much from nature. It's, it's there standing in front of us, how, how we can best manage uh, land, the environment. Um, but, of course, you know, King Lear is, is wonderful, too, as a play. Because um, you know we have these these great landowners, these great leaders, who then are reduced to, to a sort of destitute state, you know, landless, roaming the land like you know the beggar Tom and you know the madman, the considered madman, and uh, you know it's extraordinary. I walk down the streets of, of London, and I see people like that. I see a lot of people like that, and more and more of them, uh, people who other people who sort are of members of. You know, to the world to do so, they just sort of rush by. God forbid they should approach me with their mad, uh, mad utterances. But uh, there they are, and they're, well, I'd say, if it's fair to say, that they're, they're a consequence of our unjust uh, land and tax laws. So um, it's extraordinary that, uh, that Shakespeare tapped into this with Lear. Um, and it's, um, it's wonderful rereading the play, having the opportunity to reread the play and reevaluate it because of, well, the knowledge that I've acquired in the, over the last decade or so. Um, <coughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Well, thank you, Rachel. I think we have to take too little care of. Okay, so uh, this is a very, very informal for questions and answers. Um, the only thing we ask is that uh, there is a room in the mic. Um, so, uh, wait for the mic uh, before asking your question. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation today. Um, how are land and tax laws to be considered in relation to the uh, demand for land for uh, crop production and for 
quite possibly biomass fuel production if we are, if we are to provide ourselves with a cleaner form of energy uh, in the context also of an increasing global population. Well, uh, what we need to come to terms with is that the solutions do not spring from the way things are today. If we try to resolve the sorts of issues that you're alluding to, we won't actually solve them. The reason is that within the existing social paradigm, there, is no, there can be no solution because the rules, the rule of law that Vanessa was telling us about, have been structured to preclude uh, the, what's called the sustainable solutions to the problems that you refer to. We need those solutions, but, uh, but speaking personally, I do not frankly see us achieving uh, the kinds of reforms that are needed in order that we have a benign relationship with nature and future generations of human beings and all the rest of uh, the species that occupy this planet unless we change the rules of the game. So we can wrestle with specific answers to particular questions of the sort you've raised now, uh, try and find accommodations with the existing system, but ultimately I believe they, they will be futile because we are trying all the time to compress those solutions into the existing set of laws and value system, which will not allow effective solutions. So, frankly, I can't actually offer a sensible answer to your question because I don't know how things are going to be in the future, how they need to be. You don't need me to offer you the trite answers that, that come out of the textbooks because they're there, but they all basically seek to accommodate the existing power structure and distribution of income, which is, which is calibrated to create these very problems, and therefore there is no solution. social sciences. 
Economists need to reread their classic texts. Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Sociologists need to read Social Statics, Herbert Spencer's classic text. Uh, and it's the same with all the classic texts, including Locke's second treatise on government. If we applied the, the sort of sense, the, uh, the principles that we seek to articulate in the film, in the re-reading of those classic texts, we will begin to see uh, the solution to so many of our contemporary problems. But the problem is this. I tried to reread John Locke's text 40 years ago when I was just a couple of doors up from here at Unif reading PPE. Uh, I did not score high marks with my tutor for trying to do so. Uh, I spent the last 40 years trying to get social scientists to do what Vanessa has done with literature, to go back to a, a classic text and say, let's see what we can learn from this that we've all been missing. Economists will not do that nor will political scientists, nor will sociologists. I know they won't do it because I've tried for 40 years to persuade them to do that, just to go back to their founding texts. For the last 10 years I've been thinking about what is it that leads to the failure, the, the, the unwillingness to reread those texts based on the sorts of themes in the film. Uh, I won't go through my list of explanations, but we can see today uh, in what's called the crisis of capitalism one consequence of the failure. Vanessa referred to the, current, the contemporary problem that we have. So we're not talking about a trivial uh, exercise when we say we need to go back to the family fathers and see what it was they were telling us about in their time which they could see with clarity. That includes Adam Smith who talked about what policy would be appropriate for an industrial society, and he said it was the rent of land. It includes Herbert Spencer, who said, if we're going to have a science of society, what should it be telling us about? He said, we need special laws about land, the rents belong to the community. And Locke's second treatise also doesn't quite end up saying that, but if you read it correctly, there is no other conclusion to draw other than that he laid the foundations for what Locke, uh, Smith went on to say, Herbert Spencer, and others like him, all the way through to Joseph Stiglitz. But our social scientists will not reread their classic texts in the way that Vanessa has done with one of those in literature. And until we can actually get the social science community to do so, we're not actually going to get these reforms for reasons that, as I say, I won't go into. So it needs a nation at that level to begin the process of change. Yes, we need a global context, and this is where uh, the work of uh, my colleague's uh, organization comes into being, the need to conserve nature on a global scale with certain fundamental rights to take action. But I don't believe any one nation will actually take that action until they just go back to their original founding texts and read really what they were telling us about in the past in relation to them. Just to sort of follow, follow through on, on that a little bit, I mean, of course, Vanessa didn't only reread King Lear through the film, she also read the film through King Lear. Mm -hmm. And it may be that the, the example she's given us there of a, a, a sense of a dialogue between different sorts of texts um, can, can help with this problem. And the, I'm, I'm very really struck of all the, the classic political economists who addressed this, the, the sorts of question um, that Fred's interested in the 